Huawei has launched the aluminium unibody P9 and P9 Plus following the usual standard and large pairing in the industry, both reminiscent of the Nexus 6P in some ways. The P9 has a 5.2 inch 1080p screen, is powered by a Kirin 955 chipset and comes in 3 gig and 4 gig RAM versions, oddly, along with 32 or 64 gig storage plus micro SD. The camera is notable for a dual sensor setup with one for gathering colour information and one black and white. The latter should produce better luminance data and there's some traditional Huawei software cleverness in terms of focusing options. There's dual LED flash but the bigger mission here is OIS probably because you couldn't stabilise both Leica lenses in exactly the same way. There's a 3000 mAh battery or 3400 on the 5.5 inch screen P9 Plus and it's USB Type-C all the way which is good to see. Oddly the Plus display is AMOLED while the standard one is IPS LCD, eh? The former does have Huawei's Force Touch tech though so maybe it was deemed too thick and heavy for the smaller phone. With the rather significant caveat that the 4-inch screen on this, the iPhone SE, isn't that suitable for such 2016 immersive activities as high-def gaming and media consumption, in every other respect, the SE is just about the perfect iPhone. With the gorgeous lines and the form factor of the classic 5S and 5, but the cutting-edge internals of the 6S, the iPhone SE is akin to either a blindingly good magic trick or an anachronism, a quirk of Tim Cook's spare parts inventory. I lean towards the former, and overall, I'm actually very impressed. The 2014-2015 iPhone 6 all-curved physical designs are, in my opinion, somewhat meh. The classic iPhone 4 and 5 designs were prettier, easier to grip, and, as it turns out, still unique in the 2016 smartphone world, where every company seems to copy the generic iPhone 6 curves. Unboxing the SE, you immediately remember why you loved the design in the first place. It's cold, it's sleek, it's utterly metallic, and it fits beautifully into any human grip, with far less chance of slipping out than the bar of soap iPhone 6 designs. The chamfers in the aluminium, the iPhone 4 range here, used steel, but that proved too heavy for the larger phone, so aluminium was used for the 5 onwards. The chamfers are now matte rather than polished. It's not a big difference cosmetically, but it should help prevent small dings, <laughs> for example, from drops and knocks being too obvious. The familiar screen and frontispiece from the 5S remains front and centre. 640p seems like a low screen resolution for a 2016 smartphone, but it's absolutely fine at four inches diagonal. And I had to break out a magnifying glass in order to see the pixels. The viewing angles aren't quite as good as on newer iPhones, or indeed many other top-tier smartphone rivals, but they're fine for day-to-day -day use. One extra thing to emphasise on the SC, should you have been following the iPhone world in 2015, there's no 3D touch here. You may remember from my review of the 6S that I wasn't 100% convinced by this UI feature, and it's really not missed on the iPhone SE. My doubts about 3D touch centred around the small UI gains for the deeper presses, peeking inside emails, etc., when compared to the relatively huge increase in complexity and weight for the deflection detection and the haptic response system. The fingerprint sensor is the same as in the old iPhone 5S, probably for logistics reasons. This means that recognition is not quite as lightning quick as on the iPhone 6S onwards, but it's still plenty fast enough, and in fact the Slower recognition proves one of the unexpected huge boons in the iPhone SE. With the 6S range, the recognition is so fast that the briefest press of the button with a registered finger or thumb results in unlocking to the application grid or to whatever you were doing before the phone screen went off. So you can't press the home button of a locked iPhone 6S easily to check the time, as you're well past the lock screen too quickly. Ditto trying to use the swipe upwards from the lower right corner to launch the camera application from the lock screen. You never get to see the option. On the iPhone SE, there's a seconds recognition delay, and this has the con that it slows you up very slightly, but with the huge pro that the lock screen information and features are back in play again. Down at the bottom are the usual headphone jack, a cosmetic grill, the lightning port, and a larger grill covering the single speaker. Everything mentioned so far is lifted from the iPhone 5S and the speaker fits the pattern. It's just about loud enough for speakerphone calls, podcasts and sat-nav instructions on the road. Uh, and quality is just enough. Here's a demo. Got a Kari Joe. 
but it should get louder. And that's about as loud as it goes, really. It's fine, it's fine for inside the house, but I really would wish something a bit louder when you're out on the road, for example. Probably the final thing of note that is inherited from the 5S is the 1.2 megapixel front facing camera. So don't expect high resolution selfies. In fact, on the imaging front, the iPhone SE is all about the uh, rear camera, which is 12 megapixels and with f over 2.2 aperture, the same hardware as used in the iPhone 6S. Wow. Whereas on the latter, the camera protruded with a small bump. Here, the slight extra thickness in the obelisk form factor uh, means that the exact same camera is perfectly flush with the polished plastic top rear of the phone, together with the rear microphone and dual tone LED flash. Here are some photo samples. Although results are identical to those from the camera in the 6S reviewed in the Phone Show 263, they're so good that I thought you might enjoy some new images. As usual with iOS and iPhone, the built-in camera is quite limited in options, but there are a bazillion third-party alternatives, each with their own twists and advantages. The iPhone SE has the option to shoot video at 4K, and very nicely, though it's still not trivial to play back 4K on most devices and computers, so stick to 1080p for now. Still, at least the SE is future-proof. There's also no need for extracting eight megapixel stills from 4K on the whole, since there's a blazingly fast, Hope you can hear that burst mode here for anything that's happening quickly. Plus, you can still do stills extraction for 4K if you really want to using several third party tools. The internals of the iPhone SE also have a lot in common with the iPhone 6S. An A9 chipset, 2 gig of RAM, means that the SE absolutely flies if you find something that would normally tax a smartphone on iMovie, re rendering, or compositing of uh, 1080p video clips takes place around four or five times as fast as my main Mac, <laughs> which admittedly is a few years old, and it's competitive with the latest Mac hardware thanks to all the GPU wizardry on board. In fairness, having said how fast the iPhone SE is, I should also point out that the transitions baked into the OS rather limit how much of the raw speed can be shown in the UI. In other words, the older iPhone 5S and uh, SE side by side are almost indistinguishable in terms of user experience, despite one phone being two and a half years newer. Out of the box, the iPhone SE runs vanilla iOS 9.3 with the link clicking Safari bug fixed 9.3.1 arriving during the review period. I had the 64 gigabyte version, by the way, since iOS itself takes up around four gigabytes and the alternative 16 gig version would have left me, the user, with only 12 gig free for everything, apps, data, photos, videos, music. It sounds doable if you try really hard, but I'll bet you still come a cropper six months down the line. Smartphones in 2016 all need at least 32 gig of storage of one kind or another. Not to be confused with RAM, of course, i.e. the memory chips in which iOS and its applications run. The iPhone 5S came with one gigabyte and ran pretty well on the whole since iOS is very frugal, but the use of the A9 chipset here also dictates at least two gigabytes of RAM and hardware. So that's what the SE sports. And more RAM is always better, don't worry. More things can happen at once behind the scenes, bigger things can render or calculate and so on. One worry about having more RAM is that it'll eat up more battery power, but the A9 chipset is so efficient that I saw better battery life on the SE than on the 5S in terms of percentage drop per day. Plus, the SE sports a battery of slightly higher capacity than the 5S at 1642 milliamp hours. Then there's the use case of a typical iPhone SE. <laughs> All the usual smartphone uses, and then a few extra, such as Apple Pay, of which more in a moment, but probably stopping short of watching long movies or long gaming sessions due to the smallish four inch screen, which is fine. This is a different beast to the 6S and 6S Plus. And it means that two of the biggest causes of power drain in larger screen smartphones are avoided. In day to day testing over the last five days with my primary SIM in and with the usual use, PIM, email, social photography and so on, I still always had over 30% left at the end of the evening. iOS 9 is a well known, of course, since it's available to all iPhones, even as far back as the older 4S here, though not all new features have made it across the board. The iPhone's interface, of course, was conceived on a three and a half inch screen, famously, to be accessed with one thumb. And this still works on the four inch screen here on the SE, just about, though those with small hands will struggle with the back controls at the top left of the UI. Still, it's a refreshingly one handed device compared to most 2016 smartphones, including the other current iPhones. 
when you're out and about with shopping or holding a kid's hand and that call comes in or you need to loop up something urgently, sometimes one-handed is a must and the SE delivers, as did the 5S before it. Night shift is new for iOS 9 and introduces an obvious red shift in the backlight colour during evening and night hours, or manually enabled here, <laughs> according to your settings. It's disconcerting at first, but you soon grow to love and appreciate the feature, especially checking the time in the night or queuing up a podcast to go to sleep to. The SE includes the same low power motion coprocessor as the 6 and 6S ranges, so you can track steps even without an Apple Watch or Fitbit or similar. The number of health metrics here is impressive, though most do depend on a connected accessory or on manual input. Unlike the older 5S, the iPhone SE includes an NFC aerial here and support for using this to connect to terminals to pay for things. Getting set up for Apple Pay is trivial because the App Store already knows your credit and debit card details so they're offered immediately. It's then just a case of, for example, double pressing the home button on the lock screen to choose which card you want to pay with, uh, leaving your thumb on the button to authenticate and then tapping it next to the terminal. It works really, really well and it's really easy. Of course, you can do the same with most modern cards, but for anyone with their phone usually in their hand, <laughs> and it's more likely with the SE, this will be more convenient still. Aside from the smaller display, there are very few gotchas for the SE in the modern world of 2016. The low resolution selfie camera may bother some, ditto the lack of a barometer for measuring altitude when hiking up the mountain, as you do, but they're hardly showstoppers. And the two big issues, the slower fingerprint sensor and the lack of 3D touch are both pluses in my book, as I mentioned just now. So who's going to buy the iPhone SE? Well, principally owners of older iPhones with the SE making the perfect upgrade from older uh, iPhone 4S or iPhone 5, gaining biometric authentication and contactless payment along with a vastly better camera. These owners should run, not walk to the Apple Store and buy without hesitation. The upgrade from the two and a half year old iPhone 5S is a much tougher question, not because it's not worth it if you have the money, but because the 5S itself is still a darn good smartphone. And throughout my SE testing, which I enjoyed, the nagging thought at the back of my mind was, you know, all this would happen pretty much the same on an old 5S. The clincher for such owners will be the addition of NFC payment, of course, if that's something they've always wanted. Plus, hey, the camera is even better. There may even be the odd iPhone 6 or 6S owner <laughs> returning to their first love and the uh, chamfered iPhone 4, iPhone 5 form factor. I challenge any such person not to be impressed all over again when they hold the unadorned SE. But they'd have to be OK with cutting down on media playback and gaming, and that might be a jump too far. As I said at the start, the SE is the perfect iPhone in many ways. True to Steve Jobs' original vision for the device, the most refined physical design, the cutting edge internals with specification cuts that help rather than hinder, and best of all, a price that's very decent for an iPhone. The 5S 64 gigabyte was around £700 when it launched in 2013, yet the iPhone SE 64 gigabyte, which massively performs it, in every way, let's face it, is only £439, a 38% decrease in real-world retail price. The iPhone SE won't set any sales records for Apple, but expect it to be a very solid seller for the next couple of years, since it has the compact smartphone flagship market almost entirely to itself.